And one last time, where does one learn about which ports are which devices? Well, one does not simply read the Intel software development manuals. Promised back in Architecture 2001 that we would eventually, in Architecture 4001, get to the point where we would understand these data sheets a little bit better, specifically the chipset documentation. The first thing that you need to know is that there's actually two different types of port IO address spaces. There's fixed ports, which are always going to be at a very specific port, and they can't be relocated, and sometimes they can be disabled, but not always. And then there are variable ports. These are ports that can actually be assigned a particular port by the software, such as the BIOS or the operating system, and they can be moved around, and no matter where they're moved in the port I.O. address space, they will still map to the same particular piece of hardware. So first let's consider fixed I.O. ports. And while all port I.O. is generally speaking a gateway to a black box, in the case of fixed I.O. ports, the PCH on your system may say something about which port has which device behind it. Of course, the other side is some particular piece of hardware, and every piece of hardware can behave slightly differently. It's ultimately up to the hardware maker how it behaves. And that's why it can be very difficult to understand what's going on if you don't have a particular fixed port mapped to some particular piece of hardware. And so we had seen things like this before in 2001. This is an example from a 7 series PCH, and they have tables inside the data sheets, which you should have found the data sheet by now, and so you should be able to find this kind of table. And the tables list both fixed and variable address ranges. So starting with the fixed ranges, you can th see things like DMA controllers, interrupt controllers, and so forth. Now, in particular, you know, the things can be not particularly illustrative in talking about what this particular hardware is. For example, port 60 has historically been used for the Intel 8042 keyboard controller. Given the chip number, you can expect that this has been used for a very long time, since around the time of the first IBM PCs. And this is a type of device that would have port 60 being used for an index into the keyboard controller and port 64 used as a data port. But you don't get any of that detail by just looking at the data sheet. It just says it's a microcontroller. It doesn't tell you what it is, doesn't tell you how you access it, what the commands are, or anything like that. Another thing that we actually did see before was port 70, and that was used for the CMOS and real-time clock. It also had an element of use for non-maskable interrupts, but we didn't cover that before. Another thing we're going to see quite a bit later is the port B2 and B3. These are listed as power management, and so that doesn't really tell you a whole lot of anything. But specifically, this is going to be used for power management causing system management interrupts, which system management mode being for system management, power management is one of its jobs. And so this is basically a way to invoke system management mode to have it go off and do some power management things. So the key takeaway, if you look at the data sheets, is that there's a lot of different devices that are mapped to fixed I.O. address spaces. And the space is actually very fragmented. There's a whole bunch of unused spaces in there. And so a particular hardware vendor could use any of those fixed port IO ranges and map them to some particular custom peripheral that they have. And that can make it extremely difficult to figure out what is actually behind the curtain. Because of this very fragmented space, Intel these days doesn't recommend vendors actually use the port IO range for accessing peripherals. They recommend that you use memory mapped IO.